Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 9th of November 2015, the podcast that ships with Yowie. <laughs> you see what I did there? Yeah. This is your host, Shane Killian, and joining me again is Travis Retriever. Travis, welcome back to the show. Great to be back. Let's trigger the news of the bogus. And we've been following the extradition hearing of Kim.com, and this week the defense presented their arguments, and it turns out that as bad as the U.S.'s arguments and evidence were that we covered a few weeks ago, they had to engage in cherry-picking and mistranslation to get it to be that good. Wow. So .com's lawyer, Ron Mansfield, just started basically trashing everything they said, and in particular the uh, incriminating Skype calls, which he said they had on purpose mistranslated. They were originally in German, and they had mistranslated those into English. So basically what we're saying is they were about as well translated as Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, I totally went there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we talked about one that said, quote, at some point, a judge will be convinced how evil we are, and then we are in trouble. And I was like, come on, that's just hyperbole. You know, evil people don't actually say they're evil. No one sees themselves that way. So it was, if, if he had said that, it would have just been hyperbole and not a confession of any kind. But it turns out that was mistranslated. Three independent German translators said that it should be translated as, quote, because at some stage, a judge will be talked into how bad we allegedly are, and then we will be in a mess. Yeah. So, yeah. A little bit different there. Yeah, just a tad. <laughs> so Mansfield said, quote, It's not only a misrepresentation which was known by the United States, it is one which it has exploited for its own benefit. And he said the U.S. went over several years of Skype calls and transcripts, and they just plucked out what they wanted and just discarded everything that contradicted their case. I uh, said, quote, What the United States have done here is simply bundle up years of selective or cherry-picked conversations where those conversations appear to show an awareness or knowledge of copyright infringement. Which, well, to all this I can just say, even if it was true that they were in violation of copyright law, it's a completely bogus law to begin with. Well, and it's a civil infraction anyway, not a criminal. Yeah. And Mansfield brought up something that we've talked about several times in several different stories, and that is how far a web hosting company or a company running a website can be held liable for the actions of their users. And he said that in both New Zealand and the United States, laws exist to protect the service providers and the U.S., is trying to get around this by creating a criminal liability where none exists. Yeah, it just reminds me of what Bill Clinton started with the DMCA. Remember how it made it so that people who upload copyrighted stuff to YouTube, well, that would apparently make YouTube uh, liable in some way. Yeah, and then you have to jump through those hoops to get your safe harbor, which they should have had to begin with no matter what. Yeah, because basing laws that all of us have to obey or be shot on logical fallacies is, you know, totally uber-rational, you guys. <laughs> uber-rational? Well... You mean like Bernie Sanders is being going against Uber while using it himself? Eh, I was not <laughs> using Uber like that. Uh, <laughs> Uber as in, like, bear. Uh, eh. Okay. So, Mansfield said, quote, what the U.S. is effectively saying to internet service providers is you need to actively investigate copyright infringement and stop it because if you don't, you'll not only be civilly liable, but criminally liable. Internet giants like Google, Facebook, and Twitter are immune from prosecution and to indict them would result in unprecedented public outrage. What I'm wondering is, so how does this tie in with ISPs? Right now, the way it works is ISPs are under no obligation to monitor your traffic to see if you're doing anything like torrenting or anything. But if they do, and the government asks them for that data, they have to hand it over. Of course, there are plenty of them out there that are trying to say, no, they have to spy on you, they have to police you, and Gosh. things like that. So by that logic, a bank robber or a criminal was aided and abetted by the government because he used government roads. 
Yes, Status, it works both ways. Oh yeah, the roads gave him access to a quick round away from it. Oh, but yeah, we, as we all know, that doesn't count because... Yeah, I mean, let's be honest here. With Wu, be it Statism or Antifax or whatever, inconsistency and fuck you got mine is their bread and butter and always has been. Yeah, well, and it's just that this idea that... When you get online and it all gets digital, everything's different for some reason. Probably the most infuriating of stuff like that, of topsy-turvy stuff, would be like how they say, remember, driving and your ability to travel is a privilege, not a right. Even though these are the same people who would no doubt say, and if you don't like it, you can just leave. But, oh, that's a can of worms for another day. <laughs> I, I think we've, we've covered that one before sufficiently. Yeah, I'm sure. So the hearing was supposed to be over this week. I was hoping to get more up-to-date information, but not only have they not released any news reports for the last couple of days, apparently the hearing is going into next week as well. And even if it does go against .com, he'll have the right to appeal, which could run things well into next year. Oh boy. And state courts being as super efficient and awesome as ever, herpa <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so a few thoughts. One, okay, is .com his actual la real last name? I think he legally changed his last name to .com. That is just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so second... They've said in reports what his uh, original last name was, and I forget what it was. But Yeah, the second question is, so for those of us like me who aren't really legal savvy, what's extradition? Extradition means that... If you are in country A and country B says you broke the law, extradition means that country A has to hand you over to country B for trial. Wow. That's actually forcing you to go to the other country for trial. Good luck to you, Cam. I still remember way back when, before Mega Upload was taken down, how... Do you remember that one video of artists celebrating Mega Upload and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, there were some really big names on that. Oh, yeah, Mega Upload. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty good site. I'm sure, yeah. It, it was like, I don't, I don't know if it was actually the first cloud storage site, but it was certainly the first of the really big ones. Say, if you're tired of the promos in this podcast, well, the patrons got it early and with no ads or promos. Just go to patreon.bogosity.tv and donate at any level. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government censors. It's essential in this day and age. So go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world. And they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home, and don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. And speaking of Bogosity with GovCo, when they meet the internet... Whew. Yep, it's yet more <laughs> encryption bogosity. The UK is trying to make it illegal for companies to offer strong end-to-end -end encryption. And we've talked about this before, how Apple and Google and others built into these new smartphones encryption so advanced that they can't decipher it. They don't have the keys. Awesome. They can't unlock it. They can't decrypt the content. Which is a good thing. Yeah. So, of course, governments don't like it. And so the UK has proposed the Investigatory Powers Bill, which would put a requirement on tech firms and service providers to provide the unencrypted version of the communication to the police or spy agencies if requested. And like I was saying earlier, what they do now, if they just don't have it, they'll say, well, we don't have it, we can't give it to you. This would require them to actually collect the unencrypted versions, which means they would have to have the keys to decrypt it. We've talked about before how math is math, whether you're a quote good guy or a bad guy. 
So if GovCo has all this stuff, what do they think is going to prevent someone from hacking into their files with all that stuff? Well, I mean, that's the whole thing about it. If your phone is your computer and increasingly it's your life, you know, you don't want someone being able to just grab a hold of and get inside it. And the way you do that is to make sure that you are the only person on the planet who can decrypt it. But, you know, they're mandating that, oh, no, you have to, even if it's just like you have to keep a copy of their encryption keys, well, what happens if someone hacks into that database? Yeah. So this goes back to Prime Minister David Cameron, who never made a surveillance bill he didn't like, <laughs> and is just so much so grand that this will get in the way of all that. And he said that terrorists, pedophiles, and criminals must not be allowed a safe space online. Gotta love to use the word safe space there. Yeah, if they don't have the ability to be safe with that stuff, well, guess what? Neither do they, neither do we, and neither does anybody else. Right. The only way to stop those guys from having a safe space is to stop the rest of us from having a safe space as well. So, uh, for example, Apple on its website says that they have, quote, no way to decrypt iMessage and FaceTime data when it's in transit between devices. So unlike other companies' messaging services, Apple doesn't scan your communications, and we wouldn't be able to comply with a wiretap order even if we wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I, I've given Apple a lot of flack over the years. But yeah, one thing I will legitimately say and give them mad props for that I do like about them is that they're really good with security. They've gotten really good over the last few years. And so has Google and a lot of the others. And of course, you have apps like TechSecure, that let you do that. I think really that's my only problem with Apple services like iMessage. You can only use it on iOS devices. You can't use iMessage to communicate with someone on an Android phone. Yeah, uh, typical Apple. So last month, Assistant Commissioner Mark Rowley, who is the country's most senior counterterrorism officer, according to The Telegraph, said that for these companies, it was, quote, a part of their strategy, they design their products in full recognition that they will be unable to help us because of the way they have designed them. Poor widow baby. Translation. Oh, they're out to get us their meanies because they didn't bend over the right way for us, her dur. Cry me a friggin' river. Yeah, and of course, stopping the government from getting it is the only reason anyone would ever want to secure something in that way. Yeah. Like, it still reminds me of this one thing you posted on Facebook regarding the pin number or whatever, and it was like, you were saying like, oh, come on, you make the pin part of the of the crypto. Oh, yeah, that was because of the European chip and pin. Because supposedly we have chip and pin now, except there's no pin, it's just chip. And all of the uh, security people are going, wait, what? You're not putting the, you gotta have the pin. Well, it turns out that... In Europe, where they were supposedly doing it correctly, they weren't doing it correctly. The pin was not actually a part of the crypto. The pin was just like, okay, we're giving you the pin to the card. Have we got the right pin? And the card would come back with yes or no. And if yes, it would say, yes, you got it right. Good for you. Here, have all the information you need to take my money. Oh, oh my God. And hackers came up with this little thing that you could... Just the, these tiny little wires and such that you could put on like a piece of scotch tape and put it over the chip such that any time it asked that question to the card, it would just bypass whatever the card would come up with and always answer with yes. Wow. So, I mean, you could put in, you know, one, two, three, four or whatever for a pin. Doesn't matter what. It would just say, yep, that's the right one, even if it's not. God. So, yeah. So, dear European poster who thinks that the, who smarmily will talk about how awesome their government is compared to the U.S. Yeah. Glass houses, bro. So, getting back to the story, a spokesman for the Home Office said, quote, The government is clear we need to find a way to work with industry in other words, point guns at them, Match. as technology develops to ensure that, with clear oversight and a robust legal framework, the police and intelligence agencies can access the content of communications of terrorists and criminals in order to resolve police investigations and prevent criminal acts. Because they get to just, remember, declare that you're a terrorist and you're a terrorist. Yeah. So he continues, quote, 
That means ensuring that companies themselves can access the content of communications on their networks when presented with a warrant, as many of them already do for their own business purposes, for example to target advertising. These companies' reputations rest on their ability to protect their users' data. And so their idea is to force them to implement a, what is essentially a massive security vulnerability and liability? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, Jesus. Also, this bill would require internet companies to retain web browsing history for up to a year. Oh, Jesus. I was thinking back to what we covered a few months ago. Uh, one of the guys who had some knowledge about one of the guys in the Boston Marathon bombings and they were trying to get him on a violation of Sarbanes-Oxley because he cleared his browser history. Really, that marathon bombing thing should pretty much be proof positive that these measures do absolutely nothing to catch or prevent crime. Well, and that's like what a lot of people are saying. They're like, you know, how effective is these? Well, that's classified. Do you really think if they actually stopped an actual terrorist that they wouldn't be parading that terrorist face in front of all the TV cameras and everything and hailing this great victory. Of course. It's like the fact that they don't disclose that information shows that they know it'll make them look bad. So Prime Minister Cameron told the ITV show this morning, quote, that's the name of the show this morning, <laughs> not, not literally this one, all right. quote, as Prime Minister, I would just say to people, please, let's not have a situation where we give terrorists, criminals, child abductors safe spaces to communicate. It's not a safe space for them to communicate on a fixed telephone line or a mobile phone. We shouldn't allow the internet to be a safe space for them to communicate and do bad things. Okay, which even if that statement is true, that it's not a fixed phone line or a mobile phone, to me, that just sounds like a reason to get rid of that stuff on mobile and telephones, too. Fuck that <laughs> shit. Well, and you can get Red Phone, too, and then do your secure communicate. You're not gonna stop the people who really want to do this. Or who actually know what they're doing. Of course it's going to be the folks who actually don't know what they're doing. That is, it's kind of analogous to that they try to do stuff to, quote, help the poor. And of course it always ends up hurting them the most. A lot of the people who tend to be most in favor of these kinds of idiotic measures tend to be, I really hate to go there, but generally people who are older, i.e. baby boomers and beyond. But if you think about it, a lot of this stuff is going to end up backlashing and hitting them pretty hard too. Like, you know, if some stuff tries to hit them with fraud or steal their credit card number, or because they didn't know or learn how to do it properly because the actually good alternatives were physical on removed the way they are here, I mean... Yeah. Oh, what was I reading a couple of days ago? I think it was one of the uh, British politicians. And she was saying about, oh, phone metadata is nothing. It doesn't matter if someone gets your phone metadata. So someone made a FOIA request for all of her phone records. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know if she's responded yet, but that should be entertaining. Yeah. But I mean, it, it just goes back to what you were saying earlier. Like they're saying... I don't remember if it's Threema or Tech Secure, but it's one of those that ISIS is using to communicate securely so they can't track them. And therefore, that's a tool for terrorists. Well, then, like you said earlier, that just means that a car and a road are tools for bank robbers. Yeah. You know, same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So Lord Carlyle bemoaned what he called a, quote, lot of demonization over this. He said, quote, I think it is absurd to suggest the police and the security services have a kind of casual desire to intrude on the privacy of the innocent, despite the fact that they've been doing that for years and years and years. They have enough difficulty finding the guilty. Which is an argument against them, showing that they're that bloody incompetent. <laughs> yeah. No one has produced any evidence of casual curiosity on part of the security services. Well, except for Edward Snowden. Or, you remember him? Or what about Julian Assange? Yep. Watching government try to interact and do this stuff with technology, it's like watching a rabid monkey or ape smash a computer or a science textbook or a mobile phone into a rock when it doesn't do what he wants it to do. I mean, it's just pathetic. Well... It's good to know that they're not all like this. Lord Strasburger said that Cameron, quote, does not seem to get the need for strong encryption. Three times he said that he intends to ban any communication we cannot read, which can only mean weakening encryption. 
Will the minister bring the prime minister up to speed with the realities of the digital world? And by the minister, he was referring to Baroness Shields. And notice how these are all like lords and barons and stuff. Yeah, I'm really glad we dumped all that tea in the harbor so we wouldn't have to put up with their crap. Oh, but... <laughs> oh God. It's like, are we still making laws in the 19th century over there? Is that what's happening? Is it the people at Downton Abbey who are making these laws? I mean, yeah. Bonus points if the same people he has jurisdiction over call us the people who want feudalism. Hey, we're not the ones being presided over or advocating friggin' lords and barons and shit. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, so Baroness Shields had said, quote, The Prime Minister did not advocate banning encryption, which is a straw man. No one said he did. He wants to ban secure end-to-end -end encryption. We don't want to ban locks. We just want to ban locks that actually work. <laughs> well, we may as well be saying that. <laughs> so, quote, He expressed concern that many companies are building end-to-end -end encrypted applications and services and not retaining the keys like every security expert on the planet says they shouldn't be doing. <sighs> And she mentioned another secure application, WhatsApp. Oh, this is the one I was thinking of, which is being used by ISIS. And you know, she says that must be subject to decryption and have all their information handed over to law enforcement. But of course, it never works the other way around with them. Like when Snowden and them try to expose what they're doing, all of a sudden it's pitchforks from the government yep. being lobbed at them. Oh yeah, go after the whistleblowers and not the criminals the whistleblowers exposed. Yeah. If you think government provides, like, what is meant by rule of law in a positive way, you're delusional. There are many ways to do rule of law. This ain't one of them. Hackers. Terrorists. The NSA. But I repeat myself. Your online security is under attack, and the weakest point is your password. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass plugs into your browser and allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords anywhere on the web, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers and all your computers, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, membership info, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications and even mobile devices, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. And now, one from our This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things department. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the government spent more than 86 times as much as they needed to build a gas station in, where is this, Sheboygan. Oh, that's Wisconsin. Oh, no, 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 wait. Shebergen in Afghanistan. Why is it always Afghanistan? Uh. Yeah, so this is another report from the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, or SIGAR. <laughs> you gotta love their acronyms they come up with. Yeah. There I'll are people who just sit in a room just coming up with acronyms. Yeah. yeah. How much do you want to bet that they have actually, like, people on payroll whose only job it is to do that? <laughs> you know they do. <laughs> Chief Backronin Manager. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, so we're talking about a compressed natural gas station that the United States paid $43 million to build, even though similar stations in Pakistan cost a mere $500,000 oh or less. Yeah, the Department of Defense has no idea how this happened and cannot tell us anything about where the money went. And this was a project by the Task Force for Stability and Business Operations, which was there to, quote, Demonstrate the commercial viability of CNG for automobiles as part of a broader effort to take advantage of Afghanistan's domestic natural gas reserves and reduce the country's reliance on energy imports. So how do you do that by building it for 86 times the amount that it should take? I don't know, but... Oh, I would definitely say something was taken advantage of. Snark, snark, <laughs> lol. Well, and this was shut down six months ago, and according to the Department of Defense... There's no one around who can even answer the question as to where the money went. No people, no documentation, 
Nothing. Okay, you, so Shane, you also picturing a few people, or maybe even one person, you know, like who somehow managed to grab that money and is now in a villa, like in the south of France or something. <laughs> I don't know. If I had money like that to get a nice villa or something, I don't think it'd be France I would go to, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably be going to Hong Kong myself, but, uh, <laughs> you know. So, Special Inspector John F. Subco said, quote, It is both surprising and troubling that only a few months following the closure of TFBSO, DOD has not been able to find anyone who knows anything about TFBSO activities, despite the fact that TFBSO reported directly to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, operated in Afghanistan for over five years, and was shut down in March 2015. Also, apparently there were no feasibility studies done to determine if they had the necessary infrastructure for CNG, and it turns out they don't. <laughs> and Cigar's report concludes, quote, It's not clear why TFBSO... They really needed to get the Cigar people working on TFBSO to come up with something better for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give us a good backronym for that. Anyway. It's not clear why they believe the CNG filing project should be undertaken. In fact, an economic impact assessment performed at the request of TFBSO found that the CNG filling station project produced no discernible macroeconomic gains and a discounted net loss of $31 million. Of course, if it hadn't cost them $43 million to build it, maybe it wouldn't have been that much of a loss. And these are the people that the burn victims want to manage our economy. Yep. People who don't know what an API is versus software, who think crypto is magic because it, them having it doesn't apply to everyone else because potato. It's sort of like what PJ O'Rourke said about healthcare. So you think it's expensive now, just wait until it's free. Yep, true that. Got to run see this one post, like how... And I'm hoping this was fake, though it probably wasn't, of this one uh, burn victim saying, well, these guys are misog talking about how all these Bernie Sanders programs will cost. I mean, they must be total sexist misogynists. I mean, don't they know? Why would it cost anything? It's free. <laughs> free doesn't cost anything, duh. Yeah, I had someone on my Facebook claim it was a uh, parody, but he couldn't point me to any link showing that, and there was nothing in. When you're doing a parody, you have to give some kind of wink, some kind of clue that you're not being serious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it kind of reminds me of the folks when Obama was elected saying, oh, you know, I don't have to pay off my house now. He's going to pay off my house. I don't have to. Yeah, just uh, grief. Would have been nice, but no, he paid off the bankers houses. Yeah, pretty much. That's what he did. <laughs> and of course, it's evil when Bush does it, when he calls it a bailout. But oh, but uh, when Obama does it, it's a stimulus. And well, no, that's totally different, even though it's the exact same people getting the money for the exact same reason. <laughs> because yeah, why not? And here we are wasting $43 million on this natural gas station in Afghanistan. Oh, but we cut food stamps, so that makes it even. Yeah. Gotta love those priorities. <sighs> or maybe what? they just built it with $800 hammers, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or they probably cramped on, like, you know, $600 plus dollar, uh, toilet seats <laughs> or whatever it was. I don't know if Jim and Tammy Baker's toilet seats were that nice. Those had better be the most comfortable dang toilet seats ever, complete with warmer and bedded, I tell ya. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if they even have a built-in warmer and butt massager. <laughs> oh, I can dream. <laughs> not going there. Oh, God. <laughs> Literally, not going there. <laughs> now you can make Amazon purchases with Bitcoin by going to purse.bogosity.tv. That's P-U-R-S-E. Moreover, most purchases can be made at a discount. Save an average of 20% just by buying from Purse, or get even greater discounts by linking your Amazon wish list. Go to purse.bogosity.tv. Bogosity.tv is a participant in the Amazon Services LLC Associates program, an affiliate advertising program designed to provide the means for sites to earn advertising fees by advertising and linking to Amazon.com. Just clear your cookies and go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv or check the right-hand side of the podcast page for Amazon's best deals, including the deal of the day and limited-time lightning deals on all sorts of great products. So next time you buy online, go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv. And now let's deoxidize this week's biggest bogan emitter. 
And this week it goes to lots of environmentalists who have been sending hate-filled comments, including death threats, to Dr. Jay Cullen of the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria for pointing out that the world is in basically zero danger from the radiation from Fukushima. But I thought the leftists were totally pro-science, bro. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had a Fukushima story, but what happened was Dr. Cullen had started a radionuclide monitoring program in 2014 called the Integrated Fukushima Open Radionuclide Monitoring Project. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Or INFORM. Okay. (laughs) Another great (laughs) acronym. (laughs) And he said, quote, The goal and motivation was that people were asking me, family, and friends, and the public at large, what the impact of the disaster was on B.C., British Columbia, on the North Pacific, and on Canada. I started looking for quality monitoring information so I can answer those questions as honestly and accurately as I could. And he actually thought that the public might appreciate knowing what the scientists knew, which was basically, there's no problem. As usual. But the hate campaign started, and notice how feminists are silent about this one, too. Yeah. He was called a shill for the nuclear industry and a sham science. One of them said that it was, quote, a cold war against the highest and most powerful of the elites of this world. Uh-huh. I can't even parse that last. <laughs> oh, it's just the, it's this big, you know, cadre of elite scientists that are out to control us all somehow. Yeah, but you see, but you know, it's the ones on the right or libertarians who are conspiracy theorists and into yeah. science. Yeah, give me a freaking break. So Cullen said, quote, I knew there were lots of individuals who felt strongly about nuclear power, so it wasn't a surprise that there were those who didn't accept what the scientific research was showing, but I have to admit the hatred and the threats I received, that was somewhat of a surprise. Oh, reminds me of, uh, hate to distract from this story a bit, but reminds me of a bit of uh, Blame the First posted. Shame we can't get him on here, but anyways. The polar ice caps have actually added more ice on net. Well, the Antarctic ice cap has. Well, at least that The South one. Pole ice cap. Yeah, so the biggest yeah. one. In fact, it's at a record high now. Yeah, and this is, of course, despite the naysayers who I would hear within the last year saying, oh, well, you know, because of the black or black soot and stuff, it's making it so that the sun melts the ice more, so it's now reversible, you know. It's But as usual, they're full of crap. <laughs> but, you know, what else is now? Well, what they're doing is they're taking what the real scientists are doing, looking at their worst-case scenario... And just assuming that's inevitable and going with it. Pretty much. I mean, it reminds me of that one bit. It was like showing like uh, the alarmist. Oh, it's us. Our cars are uh, coal and everything else. We're all going to die. Where? The denial is saying, well, no, it's the sun, the termites, volcanoes, etc. The actual scientist. It's all of those things, you morons. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. And that's usually how it goes. So Colin said, quote, I feel that the education system has failed these individuals in certain respects. Burn. I I feel their motivations are genuine and their desire to understand is laudable, but I think the reaction of hate and fear highlights the need for scientists to engage more directly with the public to explain what we do and how we do it. But of course, the more of these hate-filled reactions they get, the less likely they are to do that, which I think is the point. Yeah. Just basically trying to bully and coerce into silence. Yeah. Well, and it's all about their political agenda, and I'll say it again, the fact that so many environmentalists are anti-nuclear while spreading panic about global warming is an irony that just confounds all sense. No kidding. And it's like you've even said on your Facebook, and I've shamelessly ripped off and copied, because, I mean, I do it to you, Hawkeye and Dave, so much. I mean... I don't care. Go ahead. Rip me off. Sweet! (laughs) Hell yes. I mean, it's like, I'm sorry, but yeah, if you're anti nuclear power, then I don't want to hear one word from you about global warming. Absolutely. And when you do it to the point where you're making threats against a scientist pointing out the truth, that has to make them the lowest of the low, and they deserve far worse than being named this week's biggest bogan emitter. Hi, I'm Dave. You may recognize me from previous Bogosity episodes. However, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm also part of a podcast, the Superplex Brothers Podcast. Head on over to superplexbros.com. You can check out the podcast for video games and pro wrestling. We also have news, reviews, and editorials, and all kinds of stuff just to talk about video games and pro wrestling and everything else that comes in between. 
So if you're into that, why don't you come check us out? And now let's despeckle this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! And this week, it goes to Simon Malloy of our most favoritist website, Salon.com. Oh my god! <laughs> As Chris calls it, Saloon, <laughs> which I think is probably more appropriate because they're knocking something back, I think. hey And yes, it's more Coke Brothers bogosity. Oh, Jesus. What? What is with these people and the Koch brothers? <laughs> it's just their versions of the Rothschilds and the Bilderbergers and something. And it's the just, Illuminati. Yeah. And the patriarchal cis-hit uh, conspiracy or whatever. Yet more proof that the conspiracy theories ain't exclusive to our political folk. So what happened was Charles and David Koch were interviewed on MSNBC's Morning Joe and... Scarborough asked them if there was a Republican candidate. Wait, Scarborough? You mean like the Scarborough affair? Or no, is that something different? No, the, the Scarborough is pretty unfair. Oh, but anyway. sad face. <laughs> I'll read out Malloy, quote, Asked by Joe Scarborough if he'd found a Republican presidential candidate whom he could line up behind, Charles Koch responded, Oddly, not in great measure. It's not oddly if you get how the Koch brothers view politics. No kidding. What? What's this oddly? I mean, who are you expecting them to... Let me guess. Well, you're not a Democrat, so then you must be a Republican. Wait, you're a Libertarian? Well, that's just uh, another type of Republican, her dur. Despite the fact that folks like me have never voted for Republicans and never will. Quote, This non-endorsement of nobody is... I think that's a double negative. Tesk. ...was reported as news... Very, very important news because a very rich man said it and wealthy people are enjoying ever tighter control over our politics. Yeah, how dare he try to control our politics by saying he's not endorsing any of the candidates. And yet the unions who are like all in the top 10, like literally all the top 10. I think I think there's a couple telcos that are in the top 10. Well, yeah, no, no, no surprise But there. they mostly give Democrat as well anyway. It's like, I mean, well, okay, well, what are they trying to buy then? <laughs> yeah, and like the Koch brothers are down like number 76 or something like that. And yet the uh, telcos, labor unions, public unions, AARP and so on. Oh, but they're not trying to control. What are they? Well, what are these ones buying? I mean, come on. So he said, quote, Scarborough asked Charles Koch about a recent New York Times analysis that found that just 158 super wealthy, mostly conservative families were responsible for nearly half the money donated thus far in the presidential race. That's not a way to run a democracy, is it? Scarborough asked. Koch responded by saying, actually, oligarchy can be very good. Now note, that part is not in quotes. Oligarchy can be very good is not a quote from Charles Koch. Oh dear. Here's the quote. And it's not one of those cases where he misquoted him and I had to go digging for what he said. This is what Malloy himself is quoting. Quote, See, to me it depends on to what end. If it's to get policies that will create, open up opportunities for people, and get rid of all of this corporatism and corporate welfare, wherein what? Seven of the richest counties in the country are around Washington, D.C.? That just isn't random. It's because the government is picking winners and losers, and you want to be a winner more than you do a loser, so you give to slant it your way. Okay, that sounds pretty good to me. He wants to get rid of corporatism, get rid of corporate welfare, and have government, you know, stop taking our money to give to these corporations. So here's what Malloy says, quote, so Charles Koch, when asked if it's a problem that massively rich individuals are purchasing their preferred policy outcomes, says it's not necessarily a problem as long as it results in his preferred policy outcomes. His definition of acceptable oligarchism is that he gets what he pays for. That is a bold-faced lie. Yeah. He didn't say he wanted to buy it or have an outcome he wants so much as he just wants it out of it entirely. Yeah. I mean, good lord, this is creationist apologetics tier. Like how they say, you don't believe in our God, so you must believe in another. Yeah. Even though the person isn't they're talking to is an atheist. Yeah. Oh, you atheists are just as religious. No. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. 
Yeah, his preferred policy is not doing that at all. So either he's got Mr. Koch confused for someone else, or he's projecting so hard we could use him to signal Batman from the dark side of Europa. <laughs> Yeah, why is it that Malloy has th so much of a problem with stopping corporate welfare? Hmm. Hmm. Gee, I wonder why. So he quotes Coke from later in the interview, quote, I would love to have the government stop this corporate welfare. And ending Coke's quote, Malloy says, He either doesn't really understand the problem, or he can't be bothered to care. It's probably a combination of both. Bro, do you even self-awareness? Seriously? Projection much? <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, stopping corporate... What, what, what's wrong with stopping corporate... Yeah, I thought you looked as we're against corporate welfare. Well, unless it's something like Planned Parenthood or some other thing you like. Or renewable energy or... Yeah, hmm. or their particular favorite media outlet or whatever, but you know. Yeah. Big cable, the big labor unions, mm -hmm. the telcos. Oh, yeah. don't even get started on the telcos. Just... Uh -huh. yeah. So Malloy says, quote... The utter lack of self-awareness here is staggering. Yeah, but it isn't Coke's lack of self-awareness. It's staggering. <laughs> Coke is vehemently opposed to government arbitrarily picking winners and losers. At the same time, he's so thoroughly convinced of the correctness of his own worldview that he sees no real problem in a small, hyper-elite cadre of billionaires flooding the political system with cash to prop up their hand-picked candidates and mold the government into something that more closely resembles their vision. Charles Koch will pick the winners and losers, not the government, thank you very much. He does realize that the vast majority of those donations are from his party, the Democrats. Yeah. Oh, just look on OpenSecrets.org. I know. Check them out for well, yourself. Hell, just take a look at the super packs. Oh yeah. my god. Oh yeah, Open Secrets has all of that. They yeah, have all it was that. pretty much overwhelmingly Democrat. Well, and it's like... Why do they do all of that? Well, it's because of the corporate welfare and the regulatory state that always regulates in their favor. Thank you very much. So he goes on to say, quote, The arrogance on display here is also quite remarkable. Again, <laughs> yeah, but it's not Coke's arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is, this is just bad comedy. But then this is Salon.com, you know, home of Michael Lenz, the question libertarians just can't answer bloke. So, uh, are, are they that's really good. like the onion or the spud or something like that? They're just more coy about it. I kind of hope they are. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, if they are, then I will give them a friggin' fist bump for being the most awesome trolls of all time. <laughs> well played. Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> The Coke's confidence that his vision for the country is indisputably correct is derived from two sources, his wealth and the attention people pay to him because of his wealth. Notice he doesn't try to say he's wrong that's saying that we should get rid of corporate welfare. Yeah, and also, really, so certainty is a bad thing? Okay, so what about yours, Simon? <laughs> Why don't yours count for that? And he's open about the fact that he's trying to buy the government of his preference because he doesn't have any reason to hide it. The entire system has been corrupted to give those who can spend the most the greatest amounts of influence. So why should Charles Koch, David Koch, or any other would-be oligarch be shy about their intentions? Well, why are you being shy about yours, Malloy? You're the one going against the people saying, let's get rid of corporate welfare. Why do you like it so much? Yeah, which would get rid of this problem in its entirety. Well, not quite. You'd have to get rid of the regulatory state, too, and go to sound money. Well, you know what I mean. But yeah, I mean, man, what is with these leftists and this hatred stiffy of theirs for folks like the Koch brothers? I don't... Oh, wait. Hold that thought. I know what's going on because they actually are wealthy libertarians who actually stand up for the things and actually put their money where their mouth is for the stuff that they claim to be for, like gay marriage, among many other things that they all pay lip service to. I mean, really, I don't know what else to say. Words can't describe the stupidity of this article, which can only make Simon Malloy this week's Idiot Well, that wraps up this Mitchell edition of the Bogosity Podcast. As always, you can come to forum.bogosity.tv to read the show notes and join the discussion. This podcast depends on you to keep going, so please donate using the links on the website or at patreon.bogosity.tv and feel free to join in by sending a question, statement, news article, or rant 
to podcast at bogosity.tv. You can even stick it in an audio file if you want. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to Travis Retriever for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Until next time, here's a quote from Peter Beckman. The energy potentially available to us is, for all practical purposes, unlimited. But access to it is blocked. It is blocked, above all, by anti-technology sentiment, environmental paranoia, and interference in natural markets. Beyond these obstacles, there is little that science and technology cannot eventually overcome. We further believe that pollution and destruction of the environment is not an essential byproduct of technology. On the contrary, more science and better technology are needed to keep the environment clean. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial Adrifts 3.0 Imported License. Bogosity. Christmas time is coming, and the most classic of Christmas stories is A Christmas Carol. But how much do you know about the original Charles Dickens novella? Have you dismissed it as a children's book with one-dimensional characters amounting to nothing but platitudes and cliches? Maybe your appreciation of the book was even muted by those dry, boring, annotated books they made you read in school. My book, the sarcastically annotated A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, uses both facts and humor to present the book in a way you probably haven't seen it before. Giving praise when deserved and beratement when warranted, this book is put in the perspective of its time and shows a dimensional, multi-layered Ebenezer Scrooge from start to finish. Skepticism, history, and even economics are employed to show the book in relation to today in an easily accessible format. Appreciate the Christmas of your youth all over again, Get the sarcastically annotated A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, available at Amazon and on PDF as well. Way back in the horse carriage days, those horses, well, apparently, they produce a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. Like, literally. To the point where in some places, they were quite literally producing a whole eight feet of it. Uh Uh-huh. And the shit produces methane, and it has bacteria and all sorts of nasty stuff that just gets in the air around you. Air was far, far worse before cars, people. No kidding. It's like a lot of environmentalists have this, oh, you know, everything was great before, and then all of a sudden, boom, came the evil technologists and capitalists and stuff, and it just went to shit. No. No, they're thinking of the noble hunter-gatherers in the beautiful mountain landscape with the nice, clear, babbling brook. No, think of people swimming and drinking in their own shit water. That's what it was. Yeah. That's why the average lifespan was 19. Yep. I mean, you'd be amazed how important technology is at helping this stuff. Like, does anyone else remember 120 years ago, gasoline being considered a waste product? Or 500 or so years ago, oil being considered a waste product or something undesirable? And exactly the opposite. You know, throughout the medieval times, when the kings and everyone would have people come over, they would eat on the dishes of gold using utensils made of gold, but the king and the queen would eat on plates and with utensils made out of aluminum. Oh, boy. (laughs) Because that was the really, really, really rare rich stuff there. Mm -hmm. You had to be really, really rich to get aluminum. Yeah. That's how it is. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'd wager that my cell phone or, hell, even Skype is probably saving more trees than every hippie in the world ever will or could. Well, and as people have pointed out, Standard Oil saved more whales. Oh yeah, that's another good one. And my personal favorite is the leftists who talk about, you know, all the noble, savage Native Americans who, oh, they'd use every part of the buffalo, and will then turn around and scream when they hear about, uh, what is it, like the pink slime or whatever else or whatever? Yeah, whatever they called it. Yeah, the McDonald's was... the, The leftover meat from the chicken, they'd strip it off the bone and process it, and they use that to make McNuggets. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, I'm not Native American, but if I was, I'd be feeling like that kind of viewpoint is rather patronizing and just childish. I mean, just imagine how much better the environment would be if government would just get out of the way.